As a church in unity, we say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Will you have a seat? Um, hey, Ezra, before you leave, I want to tell you something. You, you, you about broke me, brother. Are you six years old? Five years old? Well, I'll keep going. Seven. Just tell me. <laughs> um, we, we had a seven-year-old child on his knees worshiping. Oh, to have a childlike faith again. In first service, we had a little girl, Bella, Bella Biggins, right here on her knees, worshiping. Gosh, take us back. Take us back to childlike faith. That, man, if only we could get to that point again. We're in Revelation 20, and um, I just want to be straight up with you and honest today. I'm going to cover the first seven verses, nine verses, Let's just see what the Lord does. We're going to cover some stuff in Revelation 20, um, but I'm not going to, I just want to be real. I'm not going to bore you today with, with facts. Uh, this is talking about the millennial reign of Christ. And so I want to teach at least because we told you, this is what we're going to teach on the first couple of verses of Revelation 20. So I do want to give, um, I want to teach on what that is and what that looks like and, and uh, what can we expect in the thousand year reign of Christ. But I want to say this to you. There's a lot of different views on the thousand year reign of Christ. And I don't, I'm not gonna cover those today because I do wanna go to a different place in scripture and kind of pivot, pivot uh, to a different part. <laughs> Friends, people. Uh, so here's what I wanna say. If you would like to know a little bit more information, like actual facts and to get a better understanding of the different views so that the Holy Spirit can teach you or talk to you about which view you should prescribe to, then I would ask you to do this on your own. Because sometimes we wait, wait for people to tell us and the Lord's like, no, I want you to go dig and find yourself. So if you're interested, there's an incredible website called Got Questions. It's a Christian-based um, website where I have found no fault doctrinally in this. So I think it's a good uh, resource for us. And you can type in, what are the different views of the millennium? And it'll give you some information. And let's, I would say the same thing that you can read on there. So if you're interested in that and you're like, I want to grow deeper on my own, that's a great website. What are the views of the millennium? Go to a trusted website and I do trust that one. Um, but I do want to kind of teach on what scripture says we should expect. That's where I want to go. And then I'm going to go to a different place. So what I believe, I'll be honest with you, what I believe is something called premillennialism. And what that basically is, is that the thousand year reign of Christ is literal. Um, some other views think that it's not literal, where it could just be a long number and thousand just is symbolic. Um, some also believe that we are currently living in the thousand year reign of Christ. Uh, and no, the thing is, like the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but when you look at scripture, the view that most, I think scripture supports the most is pre. Millennials, millennial, oh, we'll get it eventually. Millennialism. And what that basically is, is after Christ comes back the second time, he then goes to Jerusalem and establishes his throne in the temple. Then a thousand year reign begins, All right, So that's basically the view that I think scripture most supports. Um, but you might have a different opinion. The Holy Spirit's telling you something and I'm not looking to argue. I'd love to have a conversation about that because I think it's fun to learn from each other. Uh, but that's where I would say. But let me catch us up so you understand where I'm going with this. The thousand year reign of Christ in Revelation 20, basically the easiest way to describe this is heaven, the glory, the presence of the Lord, Jesus himself coming to meet earth. And it is Christ establishing his kingdom, authority, power, and might on this physical earth. That, that's what I believe that it is. So if you go back and you got to kind of remember the things that we've already studied in the book of Revelation, where this is after the tribulation, and it, at this point, your view of the rapture doesn't really matter to what we're talking about, because whether it's pre, mid, or post, either way, at this point, the church, which we will be raptured at some point, will be uh, received to Christ. He will come for his bride. Then what will occur then is that his saints, who is us, the church, and those of the past, will come and look and watch him fight the battle of Armageddon that we, that we talked about last week. After that battle is completed, the Antichrist and the false prophet is locked into the lake of fire, is what this says, to be tormented day and night forever and ever. At that point, that's where the thousand year reign starts. Um, we can see this in scripture, it's Revelation 20. So I wanna kinda talk about, so what does, what can we expect? What does the Bible tell us about what this thousand year reign looks like from our point of view is a Christ follower's point of view. Now, remember, I started with that's my view that it comes after the second coming because that's kind of the theology I'm going to use when we break this down. 
But let's turn to our Bibles uh, and focus on this. And it starts in Revelation 20. John says this, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand a key, the key to the bottomless pit. He also had a great chain. I'll keep reading, verse two. And he seized the dragon. Who's the dragon? Well, he's the ancient serpent. Who is the devil? Who is Satan? And what did he do? He bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the pit, shut it, and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. Let's go back to verse one where it says, then I saw an angel coming down, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. If you were with us when we studied the different judgments of God, we, had, uh, we have the seals, we had the trumpets, we had the bowls. Well, during that, you'll also see that John saw an angel coming down from heaven. It says a great star falling down from heaven, and he has the same key to the bottomless pit. What the Bible calls the bottomless pit is really, uh, the bottomless pit, they use this three words, uh, abyss, abuso, and the bottomless pit. What that is, just to give us context, is that is the place where the worst of the worst demons, demonic powers, are in prison right now. So I'm talking like literally today, there is a place called the bottomless pit, the abyss, where the worst of the worst of the worst demons are located, locked. And the, in Revelation, one of, the seal, one of the seals, I believe it is, or the, bo- uh, the bowl, the trumpets, is that this angel unlocks the key to the bottomless pit, and these demonic forces come out and locusts. They look like locusts who sting people. Y'all remember this? That's the same thing that we're talking about here. So I wanna go back though, because when we get this idea of the bottomless pit, this is the same thing where demons also realize how terrible this place is. It's like a prison. And Jesus is walking in his ministry. and He's walking and he sees this man who is possessed by demons. Remember this story? And he says, what is your name? And he says, we are legion for we are many. And Jesus delivers that man and he, the demons cry out to Jesus. They say, please don't throw us in the bottomless pit. Please don't throw us in the, into the abyss. So even the demons recognize this is the worst of the worst place to be with the worst of the worst demons or demonic forces. We have to understand in this uh, Christianity spiritual realm, there are demons who have different levels of authority. It sounds weird to say, but it's true. Different levels of authority. So do angels. And we're going to see here in a minute that in our resurrected bodies as the church, we also have different levels of authority when we reign with Christ. This bottomless pit is where these demons are sent. This is where the Antichrist is sent in the future when this all occurs. It's also where the false prophet's sent. Now we see that the devil is now thrown in there by this angel. Now, notice how he gave basically every name that the Bible describes for Satan or the devil. First, he says he sees the dragon, seized the dragon. We know in Revelation, uh, John sees a dragon and it is Satan himself. And then he says, the serpent of Abel, the ancient serpent. This goes all the way back to Genesis. Y'all know this story? When the ancient serpent, the evil serpent, lied and tricked Eve into eating the fruit, and Adam sinned as well because he did not step in front and protect his bride. So they both sinned at that time, and they were deceived by the serpent. So when he's trying to get us to understand, first off, this is the devil from the way back who fell from heaven, who wanted the authority of God, was kicked out of heaven and established as his rule, his reign on earth. Even Jesus himself calls the devil the prince of this earth. So Satan, there's different names and different meanings, and it all is represented in this one passage. First, the serpent. Well, if you translate that, we can see that, that the devil, the serpent, is a liar. That's what that means. Then you see that he said the devil Well, the devil represents destruction, it represents slander, and it represents his diabolical plan to draw people away from God and into a life of sin or rejection from the holy God. Then Satan, he also says, Satan represents the accuser or your adversary. And when I was thinking about this, I thought, man, that describes every single battle that we face. When we fall into sin, we fall into the trap of a liar. When we fall into sin, a lot of times, at least for me, the thing that comes over me and overwhelms me is shame, shame and guilt. And so what happens is my mind starts to battle with my mind and it tells me how terrible of a person I am. It starts to slander myself. You see where this is going? 
Everything, every battle that we face in life is from these definitions. He slanders, and your mind starts to tell you how terrible of a person you are. He starts to say, you can't come worship God in church. Look at what you did, the accuser. You can't come before a holy God. You are awful. You are wretched. The accuser, the liar, your adversary. And so God wants you to know, during the thousand-year reign, all of that will be completely taken away. You won't have a liar. You won't have destruction or a slanderer. You won't have the accuser. You will not have an adversary. You will be in the purest form of earth on earth before God creates a new heaven in a new earth. Now, let's keep reading here because we get into a point to where God's going to uh, really explain a little bit about what this earth will look like. Then it says in verse 4, Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those who had authority to judge it was committed to them. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. He saw those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or in their hands. It says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Years. All right, let me try to describe to you what this will look like on earth because we can't confuse this. Uh, it's really during the thousand year reign, the earth will look very similar to how it is now. That's why heaven and the presence and the glory of God is coming to the earth and he establishes his kingdom. The point of this is to prepare the resurrected saints for the coming of God's throne, Yahweh's throne in the new Jerusalem, new earth and new heaven, when God himself dwells amongst men. So the thousand year reign is the process of purifying and making the earth as we see it today, holy to prepare the way for, the, for God himself, Yahweh to dwell. Does that make sense? So I want you to hear this. During the thousand year reign, the devil will be locked up he will not be roaming. He will not be, as I just talked about, lying to you and deceiving you. However, during this thousand year reign, there will be sins occurring. They're like, how is that possible? Well, you got to understand that not everybody who comes into this thousand year reign is a follower of Jesus. Because what it said is the resurrected saints, but also those who did not take the mark of the beast. So during the battle of Armageddon and right after that, all of those who followed the Antichrist and Satan who have the mark of the beast, they are destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire. However, there will be people who never took that because they're like, that ain't right. Clearly something's wrong with this man. I'm not following him and receiving this mark. But I also don't know about this Jesus guy, so I'm not going to repent and surrender to him. There'll be people who have that view and they make it into this thousand year reign where no, they won't be deceived, but they still have their sinful, natural, sinful body. Does that make sense? That's why it says for us as Christ followers, we're seated on thrones with the authority to judge. See, for us, this is after the rapture. So when we come back, we will have a glorified body during this thousand year reign. It'll look different. We will look different. We will think differently. We will act differently. Now we will not sin during this thousand year reign. We, that we are resurrected saints who have seen the glory of God and been transformed to have a glorified body. We get that, right? I'm not talking about humans, uh, Christ followers sitting. I'm talking about those who have not received the mark, but also have not repented of Jesus, to Jesus. But we will have the authority to judge. So what is our role is that we will be placed on thrones to rule the earth under God's authority. So what is going to look different is the government, politics, Schools will look different. Work will look different. We'll actually enjoy going to work, you know? We'll see the glory and blessing of work, and we'll have joy doing it. Amen, anybody? Gotcha. Yeah. Let me tell your bosses. Our families will look different. With resurrected bodies, we, we won't battle each other. With resurrected bodies, uh, like our technology will be different. Our worship and arts will look different. Our athletics will be different. The environment as a whole will all be different. We still have natural earth, but it's the glory of God and leadership over it. And he uses the saints to judge. Now, if you look at or think about what a judge actually does, right? He sentences those who commit crimes. But if you take it a step further, I think also what a judge does is he helps people understand the difference between good and bad. Like this is wrong and this is right. 
So part of our mission, and we will do this joyfully because again, we, are, we have seen the glory of the Lord and we want nothing more but for everybody to experience this. But we will be, have authority to judge, which is to help those who don't know Christ see that what they're doing is sinful, but here's how you do it right. We sit on thrones with the authority to judge. Now, there'll be other saints who have different roles of authority, but our main purpose is to help those see and experience Christ. Another thing about the thousand-year reign, I wanna put this into your mind so we understand that we are still living in a purified earth during this time, is that all the way back uh, with Noah, have you ever wondered how all of these animals came on this boat and they stayed on there for a very long time and never ate each other, <laughs> you know? You ever thought about this? Or ate Noah and his family? I, I think about this. And it's funny how pastor was po pointing this out. It's because before that, animals lived in harmony with one another. They lived in harmony with humans. They were at peace with one another. After the flood is where beast and man started coming in opposition. It was after the flood. So when Jesus, is, Jesus comes to establish his thousand year reign, the king of peace, the prince of peace, brings a peace between the resurrected saints and his animals in creation. We see this in Isaiah 11. Uh, you can read this on your own time. But Isaiah 11 gives us a picture about what this will look like, not only in heaven, in the new heaven and new earth, but also the thousand year reign. And, and we talked about this first service because you can see that Isaiah points this out, that there will be peace between beasts and man. And it says that lions will lay down with sheep and wolves will lay down with sheep. It even goes as far as to say that kids will put their hands in the den of a viper, a snake. Anybody like snakes? Yeah, you're a liar, I know that. <laughs> At that point, there will be complete harmony between the creation of God because his purity reigns, his righteousness reigns. And we will live and we will flourish on this earth with our resurrected bodies and we will have the ability, little Ezra, who's seven years old, can pick up a, a viper and enjoy the beauty of its creation. That's the thousand year reign. And it'll look similar to where we are now. It's just the purity of the Lord dwells. His glory dwells. Now, I want to go to a point. I want to switch gears here uh, because I think what we do a lot of times as believers in Christ, when we understand that God is going to bring us into heaven, God is going to create a new earth and a, and a new, uh, new heaven, it's like, man, I can't wait for that day to experience the fullness of his presence and his glory. Like, Lord, and we should. I mean, that is going to be an incredible time where we just, for all of eternity, worship but live lives too. I mean, we're going to live our normal lives. I hope you understand that. But your life will be an act of worship. We're not just going to sit on clouds and play harps. We're going to live and experience the beauty of God's creation. But it's almost like sometimes in my mind, I'm like, Lord, I can't wait for that day. And I forget that there's little pockets here where even today that the presence of God, the heavenly presence, the glory of God still today touches earth at times. During our worship, that's what happens. When we say, Holy Spirit, come, what we're asking for is the presence of the Lord from heaven. Just touch us for a minute to help us understand your glory. Give us a taste of your glory so that we'll want to live pure, righteous lives to then experience it for all of eternity. So my point in saying this is we can't always just look for the future of that when God is trying to give that to us right now at certain times too, right? But how do we do that? How are we ushered into his presence? How do we physically kill our flesh so that we could focus on Christ? Well, it's in Luke 24. This is the second time where I mentioned where God yesterday just absolutely spoke to me in a way that I, it's hard to understand. And no, it doesn't make me better than anybody else in here, but I do feel like the Lord specifically gave this message to our church. And while my, a couple of dear brothers and myself were at a conference for the last couple of days, and these pastors were pouring into us, just helping us understand, we have to get back to teaching the crucified Christ. That is the main thing. And I think we do a good job of that here. But that is the main point of scripture is to point us to Christ and his sacrifice and how he defeated sin through the cross and then defeated death through his resurrection. And the whole point of what I got, one of the main points, I don't know if they directly said this, but I just felt like this is where our church needs to stop for a second and hear the Lord speak to us. We have to come to a place, to this place, and come expecting the Lord in this church and we have to ask the Lord, how do we stay in your presence? Inside the walls here, 
But also, how do we stay in the holy and perfect presence of the Lord in your families, in your workplace, in your homes, in the grocery store, in your cars? What do we need to do as people who call upon the Lord to stay and sit in his presence daily? The Bible gives us the answer. And I want to go, if you got your Bibles, use your phone, however you want to do it. Go to Luke 24. I'm reading from the ESV Bible. Y'all might know this story too. It's the road to Emmaus. What is happening here is Christ has been crucified. He has resurrected from the grave. The two ladies have already seen him, and they go report. Now, these other two men, these are disciples of the Lord. Now, they're not part of the 12. God had other disciples following him. These are two other guys who honestly probably walked with Jesus in his ministry. They saw Jesus. They experienced Jesus. They lived with Jesus, ate ate with Jesus. I mean, they knew as much as Christ revealed to them, they knew this about him. And this is a story about how they're walking, and Christ shows us and shows them the answer to constantly stay in the presence of the Lord. Look at this starting in verse 13 of Luke 24. That very day, Two of them, those are the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus. It was about seven miles from Jerusalem. I'm going to pull some things out before I get to the main point. Verse 14. It says that they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking, verse 15, and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. I want to point this out real quick, too. When it says in verse 14, they were talking with each other about the things that had happened, They're talking about the events that just occurred where they watched their Lord who claimed to be the Messiah, the one sent from God, the one the Old Testament prophets prophesied and spoke about. They said, they're thinking like, man, this was the guy who said he was the king of the world and now he's crucified on a cross and now he's in a grave. And so they're discussing this with each other. And I love how the Bible wants to point out this fact to us, verse 15. While they were talking and discussing, discussing, Jesus himself did what? Drew near. When we make a point to talk about our risen Lord, he draws near to our conversations. Whether that's in your growth groups, whether that's in your homes, whether it's in your work, how do you stay in the presence of the Lord? You constantly talk about him. Now, I get that. We have, we have life. It's, it is hard. It's hard to ever make every conversation about the Lord But what he's saying is, man, if you talk about me, I will draw near to that conversation. And what's crazy is I'll give you pieces of revelation about who I am just because I'm near to you. It might just be a simple conversation about how the Lord helped you receive a victory in your life or a blessing in your life, and you tell someone else about that, and Jesus draws near to you, and he's like, I want to hear that too. I mean, I saw it, I did it, but I also want to hear it. When we talk about him, he draws near to us. Verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Just because he draws near to you and you talk about him, that does not mean that you won't miss him. So it has to be something deeper to see and experience and know the glory of the Lord in his presence. Because just talking about him isn't enough, right? I mean, everybody in the the New Testament, all these teachings that we read, talk about Jesus, but some never followed him. So you can talk about Jesus all you want, and he will draw near to you, but that doesn't mean that you're going to recognize that he's here. You still might be blinded for a second about who is really with you and drawing you in. Now, watch. Here's why. Verse 7, verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and Jesus said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? I love that. The Lord knows. Clearly. That's why he's there. You talk about me, I'll draw near to you. Okay, he heard me, so now he's here. Then he says, what are you talking about? It's funny, the Lord wants them to describe it. But here's what it said. As they stood still, they looked sad. We're gonna get to why they looked sad here in a second. Verse 18, then one of them, named Cleopas, answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? Are you the only one who doesn't realize that the king, the Messiah, who claimed to be God, who performed miracles, remember that guy? He just died on a cross. Are you the only one who doesn't know that? Yeah, I I know it. Trust me. Um, I was there. The Lord says, verse 19, 
And he said to them, what things? Like, what are you talking about? He's drawing out the conversation. And then they said, concerning the Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now here it is, the gospel. He wants them to share the gospel to the one who the gospel's about. Verse 20. And how our chief priests and rulers, the Pharisees, delivered him to be condemned to death and they crucified him. He wanted them to explain the gospel to Jesus himself. He wanted them to articulate the gospel because we can also share the gospel with people but never truly understand what the gospel is about. They're sad. They're like, Lord, the guy, I'm sad because my Messiah is gone. And here's what they did. They crucified him. They hung him on a cross, the gospel. Let's keep going. This is why they're sad. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We thought he was the one. See, they wanted a different Jesus than the Jesus that was right in front of them. What happened was they knew the gospel. They articulated the gospel. They saw Christ die on a cross, but their faith stopped at the cross. And that's the problem with us today. Our faith stops at the cross. So in your struggles, in your burdens, in the things that you are trying to find victory in, are you not seeing victory in the presence of the Lord because your faith stops at the cross? You haven't looked for the resurrected king. You, you stop thinking, is this possible? Yes, God, I know that you took my sin. Yes, God, I know that, that you're going to help me. I know that you're going to restore it. I hoped that you were the one to fulfill the promises that you said you would. Are you stopping your faith at the cross? That's what they did. So God had to do something else. He said, I'm trying to get you to the point where I want you to get. And I hope that you're following with me so far because God is trying to get you to a certain point. Jump to verse 25. Look at Christ's response when they're like, I hope that he was the one. I'm sad. I thought he was it. My face stops at the cross. There's no way that Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do and raised from the grave. Here's our response. Sometimes Jesus in love and in truth says something bold and harsh, but it's also out of his grace and mercy. And they're weeping almost sad. We thought he was the one. What does Jesus say? You're foolish. When our faith stops at the cross, he's like, you only experience half of it. How foolish could you be? Uh, and then he says, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It is a mystery that how through destruction we find glory. And the walls of Jericho, when the walls fell down through destruction, it allowed the Israelites to continue on their journey through the promised land to experience glory. When our faith stops at the cross, we get the destruction, but we miss the glory. He says, you're so slow of heart. What I think that means is, for us, I know that you're like, man, God, I think that you will help me in this. God, I think that you will restore my marriage. God, I, I think that you will help bring my kids back to you. God, I think you'll break this addiction. God, I think you'll hear my bro heal my broken heart over things in this life. I, I think that you will do this. But you're still slow of heart, and we're not receiving these victories or seeing these victories. We're not seeing the purpose in these things because we're foolish and we're slow of heart, and we want answers now, 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 and now. And it's like, he's trying to give them to you, but, but you stopped at the cross. And this is what I love. Verse 26, was it necessary? This is Christ saying, was it necessary? Was it not necessary that, the, that Christ should suffer these things so that he could enter into his glory? Isn't it necessary that Christ had to be destroyed so that he could enter into his glory and also bring glory, not only to us in heaven, but here on this earth today? It is necessary for God to destroy your flesh so you can enter into glory. How do we stay in his presence? We die to self daily. We destroy ourselves daily through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by ourselves. We can't defeat our flesh. That's why Christ hung on a cross. To destroy so you can enter glory is to daily 
die to self and pick up that same cross that in our faith we stop at. Let's keep going for a second. Verse 30. These guys get to their destination and they're so intrigued with what this guy is saying. He has so much wisdom. He has so much knowledge. He has so much insight. And they're like, there's something different about you. And so they stop their journey and Jesus is almost, he says, I was going to keep going. And they're like, no, 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 no. Please stay with us. I love when you ask him, he comes and he stays. Just a nugget. Not only does he stay, he sits down and he has a meal with you. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And look, he broke it and he gave it to them. 31, and then their eyes were opened and they recognized Christ. When we want to enter into his presence and stay in his presence, here's what we have to constantly do. We go back to the crucified Christ. We go back to the story of the gospel. It wasn't until the representation of the gospel through the breaking of bread, who is his body given for the sins of the world, until they saw it physically break, then they saw it was him. As a church, if we want to stay in the presence of God, in your family, if you want to stay in the presence of God, surrounded through the Holy Spirit with the presence of God, then constantly go back to the crucified cross and lift him up as Lord. That's the only way. The only way to experience it is through the crucified cross. It says he opened their eyes and then he vanished. And look at this. And they said to each other, did, our, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on this road? while he opened us to the scriptures. I have a feeling that some of us have this burning in our hearts, but you have no idea where that comes from because your eyes have been blinded to seeing and recognizing him. And it's because we need to go back to the crucified cross. Go back to the lamb that was slain. Go back. Don't let your faith stop at the cross, carry it through to the resurrection, and we see victory. Watch this, Revelation 5. We talked about this too. This is the point where Jesus is the, God is sitting on his throne, and Jesus goes and grabs the scroll, Revelation 5, the scroll. Now, the scroll is the title deed to the earth. What does that mean? Well, God first gave man dominion over the earth. Genesis, you can read that too, dominion. When Adam and Eve sinned, when Adam sinned, it gave or it forfeited dominion over the earth and it gave it to Satan. That's why he is now, as God calls him, the God of this world or the prince of this world. It's because we, as sinful men, forfeited the title deed, ownership of this earth, and we gave it to Satan. When we first had it, our sin forfeited it. The scroll is this title deed. Like you buy a car, you sign the title. That's this, that's this scroll in Revelation 5. And so John is seeing this scene play out where God, Yahweh, is holding the scroll and he begins to weep. I, I love how a pastor pointed this out. This might be the only time there was weeping in heaven. John did and saw so many things that we as humans will never experience. Another pastor pointed out that's because of the love that he had for Christ. I think that's amazing too. But he's weeping because he wants somebody to come take this title deed back to restore and purify the earth. Revelation 5, verse 2. I'm sorry, Revelation 5, verse 5. As he's weeping, one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Why? Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. So now he can open up the scroll in its seven seals. Hold that thought. Have you ever seen a lion before? I haven't. Anybody for real? Ever seen a live lion? I mean, that brings terror because a lion represents power. A lion represents authority. It represents victory. It's a vicious animal. I've seen it on um, Nat Geo. It's wild to see the, all, the, the power. My point here is like the elders see something different than John sees. See, the elders see 
God in all his glory and all his victory. But what about John? Verse six. Weep no more, for the lion has come. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, John, he didn't see a lion. He saw the lamb standing as though it had been slain. What John saw was Christ crucified, Christ destroyed. What the elders saw was Christ in all his glory. So if we want to experience his presence, but not only his presence, his victories, go back to the lamb that was slain. And when you get a revelation of the crucified cross, that's when your mind is completely opened to the victorious Jesus who raised from the grave, who is the lion. Does this make sense to anybody? You sure? What is the crucified Christ? It is the gospel. It is that you had a God Would you, would you bow your heads? I, I, want, I want you to picture this as we, as we say this. Because in church, we love to use fancy words. We say, go back to the crucified cross. Then you can get into his, get into his presence. Then his presence will be revealed to you. Then his presence. All right, let's, let's, let's not be foolish. Let's come down. Let me explain this to you. What is a crucified cross? Christ. It is that a man, a God, who sat on a throne that ruled the entire universe. John describes the throne of God and the only thing he can say is out of it comes this incredible, shining, bright light. And the only way to describe it is by saying it has the elegance of a diamond. That God. John then goes on to say that thousands upon thousands of angels are worshiping that God, crying, holy, holy, holy. He says there's an emerald rainbow surrounding the throne that proclaims his mercy and his grace. That God took on the form of flesh, limited his deity, is, is someone getting this? I want to hear you. Is someone understanding this? That God limited his deity for the sake of his children who willingly rejected him. The suffering servant, the lion of the tribe of Judah, became a lamb led to be slaughtered. Why did he do that? Because the only way, the only way that we could have a relationship with that God is if that God in his purity and holiness died. So he did it. This is the gospel and he did it for you. I pray to the Lord that this moves your soul. Because if it's not moving your soul, then, then we have a problem. It's the same problem that the church in Ephesus had. Go read it, Revelation 2. The problem is you have lost your first love. If the crucified Christ does not bring you joy, if it does not bring you a peace, then you have lost your first love. And the Lord says in Revelation 2, if that's the case, there's only one thing that you need to do to get it right. Repent and get back to the crucified cross, Christ. He died on a cross for the sins of the world, but it wasn't over, amen? Because that was just the lamb. He is still the lion. And on the third day, he said, death cannot hold me down. Satan cannot hold me down. The entire sins of the world cannot hold me down. For I am the God who is on that throne, and I will reign in victory and might as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That is the God we are worshiping. Now, wait, I want to call you. Whoa, stop. Don't break this moment. I know you want to worship. Worship in your hearts. Worship with your action. I want to call somebody here. 
Because I have a feeling as a Christ follower, you get the story of the gospel, you can articulate the gospel, you talk to people about the gospel, yet Christ has not been revealed to you yet. So I want to call you, I want to say, if you need to get back to your first love, and you need to bow before the crucified Christ, will the church stand with me for a second? Everybody stand. If you need to, for a second, focus your eyes on the throne and the throne alone, on Jesus and Jesus alone. If this is not impacting you, please pray for someone that it is. If you're that person that's like, man, I know the story, I've been in church, I've read the Bible, but you're right, this gospel thing is doing nothing to my soul, then we're gonna ask you, that you go back to your first love. And what I wanna do is call you to come forward. If the Holy Spirit is calling you, saying that is you, I am tapping your heart, saying that is you. If you want that burning sensation of your soul to continue, if you want the eyes of the fire of the Lord to burn within you, then come forward, please. Be bold, church. Hey, let me tell you something. I'm just like you. I'm just like a lot of you because I know this. I know this for a fact that your heart for some of you is beating uncontrollably right now. But Satan has lied to you. And he said, it is gonna be embarrassing for you to walk forward. the Holy Spirit. This is a holy moment. Let's not get this twisted. And no, I'm not trying to convince you to do anything. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to call you. Would you come forward? Anybody need boldness? Well, look at your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't stop. If you need to come, if the Lord is saying, I'm trying to get you to understand, I'm trying to break the bread so you can see me, then take action. Next wave, this is gonna be really hard. There's someone in here and he's like, I'm struggling with addiction. I'm struggling with doubt. I'm struggling with bitterness. I'm struggling with fear. This is a hard one. I'm struggling in my marriage. We lost that intimacy. Would you come forward? I'm waiting because people are moving and coming, guys. I'm not not trying to draw anything here. I'm just presenting facts and saying the king of glory is calling. Anybody else? I know it's late. I know you're hungry. I get that too. But why are we here? 
we're not calling the Lord and saying, show us your glory and your presence. Can I ask the elders if you're here, some of the men of this church, some of the ladies, Robin, would you mind coming and praying over some of these ladies? Shelly, do you mind coming and praying over some of these ladies? Would you mind praying over somebody? Would you mind praying over somebody? I'm gonna call it out because hey, we're, we're family here. It doesn't even matter what they're struggling with. You don't have to know what they're struggling with. Just pray what the Holy Spirit is leading on your heart. Thank you, Bruce. Who else? Somebody come and pray for somebody. We are family here. You don't have to be a member of this church or even attend this church. It's not about a name on a building. It's about the body of Christ. Thank you, Brittany. Anybody else want to come pray? Lay hands on your brothers and sisters in Christ who just made the bold move in front of all of you to say, I have lost my first love and I want to retrieve that. I am broken inside. My marriage is struggling. My addictions are struggling. Come pray for your people. You might not be going through it right now. That's fine. Glory to the Lord, but they are. So encourage them. Hey, this is church. Hear me. I'm almost done, I promise. This is what church should look like. It's not in chairs just singing pointless songs. It's about praying for one another, loving one another, seeing burdens of other people and saying, I'm with you in this. It's grabbing their hands and saying, we are unified together through the shedding of the blood of Jesus. Okay? Last thing and then I'm done, Alex. Last thing. Please don't miss the movement of the Holy Spirit. We often say, I want to see the Lord. I want to see him moving. I want to see what the Holy Spirit looks like. Here you go. Don't miss it. When we sing this song, great are you, Lord, proclaim it. For he and he alone is great. He alone is worthy. May he receive our praise, honor, and glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.